Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the amazing environs of Upper Kaflia Lake in the dedicated wilderness area of the Katmai National Park, just across the Shelikoff Strait from Kodiak Island. The area is a mix of coastal mud flats and steep mountains. The plant life ranges from sedge grass to alders and willow stands. The land is crisscrossed with bear trails, utilized by brown bears over tens of thousands of years to migrate from their winter dens to their feeding grounds along the coast and various bodies of water. Visitors to the area are allowed to acquire visitor camping permits from the park authorities so they can camp and hike in its pristine landscape. Hunting is strictly prohibited, so the wildlife has free reign to live as uninterrupted as possible. It is truly one of the world's most remote and primitive areas that remain untouched by development or disturbance by mankind. The subject of our episode is Timothy Treadwell. He's trekked here for the spring and summer periods of 13 years, and this year has been another remarkable season. Timothy has followed and photographed the area brown bears, many of which he's named, observing their behaviors and temperaments. He pushes the envelope of common sense in many ways, believing that he is so familiar with the bears that they tolerate him and are even friendly to him. He's convinced he's cracked the communication code and can back them down from attacking him by using the intimidating actions and noises they use on each other. He's taking careful notes at some of the bears' favorite fishing holes, noting the various growls they use to communicate their intentions and frustrations. Utilizing similar grunts and gestures, he injects himself into the brown bear community successfully for a long time to study and protect them, according to him. He reported that when he first visited the area, he had sprayed an aggressive brown bear with pepper spray, and the misery of the bear was so severe that he swore off ever using it or even packing it. He didn't believe in using firearms to protect himself either. Treadwell's purpose on traveling to this area is to interfere with potential poachers who, according to him, interlope into the park to harvest bear gallbladders and other parts of bears used in eastern medicine or as keepsakes. He films them and frequently puts himself in the film shot frames to discuss the conditions and circumstances he observes. He takes the photos and film footage back to California where he presents the evidence of his findings to school children to increase awareness of the plight of the bears. He frequently performs this service for free and developed a funding base from his foundation dedicated to preserving brown bear habitat called Grizzly People. This is the organization he founded with long-term romantic interest and friend Jewel Palavac. Jewel acted as the coordinator and public face of the organization while Timothy executed the research. In Treadwell's book, Among Grizzlies, based on his experiences at Upper Kaflia Lake, he indicated that he once encountered a giant boar brown bear on a narrow trail surrounded by a bush too thick to get out of the bear's way. Treadwell collapsed on the trail face up in fear as the bear approached. The bear simply stepped over him. The bear was so fat from eating salmon that its huge gut sagged down and dragged over the prone Treadwell covering his clothes and face with stench and fuzz, but leaving him completely unharmed. The summer of 2003, Treadwell's on and off again girlfriend Amy Huguenard would visit him and even go observe the brown bears with him, frequently spending time within just a few yards of the most dangerous predator in North America, if not the world. They slept in a tent and sought campsite positioned just yards from the crossroads of local bear trails so they could keep tabs on the familiar characters they'd grown accustomed to. They stored their food in bear-proof steel drums and dealt with the weather and hardship of the area with aplomb and satisfaction. Treadwell felt as if he was performing his purpose in life and his research fulfilled him. Amy was terrified of the bears and Treadwell relished the role as her protector, leading her into close proximity of the satiated giants at their fishing holes. She was worried that he had developed a death wish with his obsession and was considering ending their three-year relationship because of it. She only had a few more days, and they would return, and she could cut the relationship off then. Treadwell typically departed the area in mid to late September, just after the last run of salmon flooded the rivers. This year, he packed his bags and flew out to the Anchorage International Airport to return to California on September 29th. 
His return ticket was more expensive than he thought it should be, and he got into a verbal altercation with the airline attendee. After the argument, Treadwell and Yuganar decided to return to their campsite for two more weeks to wait to see if they could locate a bear he had not seen all summer and wait for ticket prices to decrease. This time frame was pivotal as it put him in the brown bear's environment far later in the season after the bear's main food source would dry up for the winter. The weather quickly degrades into extremely windy and rainy fall conditions just before winter sets in and in Alaska that transition happens quickly. October 5th was another windy and rainy day, the day before the pair was scheduled to leave again. Treadwell had observed the bears that he was so familiar with had all departed, and a new, more desperate population of interior bears had moved in to try to put on their fat for hibernation. These bears tended to be older or in bad shape compared to the bears who had been feeding on salmon all summer. Treadwell and Huguenard were sheltering in their tent, waiting for the storm to blow over so their puddle jumper flight could bring them back to Anchorage. The rain and wind battered their tent, but above the normal noise of the storm, Treadwell heard a bear. The unmistakable noise of an approaching bear. He peeked his head out of the tent and saw a bear he knew well. This bear was an older bear that had a very hostile attitude. The big boar had not fared well this season and was underweight and looking for food. Typically, in an instance in which he had to confront a bear, Treadwell would stomp his feet and hiss like the bears did to each other. Just before leaving the shelter of the tent, Treadwell reached down to grab his video camera, but the bear was apparently too close to worry about it. In fumbling with the camera, Treadwell apparently turned on the recording function, but didn't successfully remove it. Timothy stepped outside the tent and tried to drive the giant Bruin off of the bluff. The bear was not frightened, though, and immediately knocked Treadwell to the ground. The bear bit and clawed Treadwell while he yelled at Amy to run away, as the bear silently mauled him. Tim's arms and face were bitten, but his main concern was to make sure Amy would get away. Treadwell was being killed by the bear, and his body was being torn apart. He cried out for Huguenard to help him, and she ran over and hit the bear with a pan. The bear was focused on Timothy and paid her no mind at all. The diminutive woman could not impart enough force to distract the bear, let alone injure it. Timothy yelled, He's killing me, over and over, and begged for help. But Amy could do nothing but watch. Treadwell's pleas for help eventually faded as his life was taken during the attack. Upon realizing she could do nothing, Amy panicked and fell into hysterics. She started screaming a shrill scream that could have been easily mistaken as a distressed rabbit. As the bear finished off Treadwell, her screams caught his attention. He approached her, and she was paralyzed with fear, and he killed her as well. The bear would then drag their bodies a short distance from the campsite and cache them to feed off of them as needed. Treadwell's supporter and fellow bear sympathizer Willie Fulton was scheduled to fly into Upper Kathlia Lake to pick the pair up. Willie turned the plane into a descending approach and landed the plane on its floats and tied off on the bank. He noticed the absence of the usual wildlife and began yelling for his friends. As he approached the camp through a trail that parted an alder stand, he saw a flash of movement in the bushes. Since he hadn't received any answer, he grew concerned and returned to the shore and the safety of his bush plane. As he walked back, he noticed a very large bear slowly stalking him through the dense vegetation. Willie quickly entered his plane and flew above the area to take a look. As Willie flew over the campsite, he could see one of the lover's rib cages with the bear positioned over it, eating from the remains. Willie attempted to chase the bear off by buzzing it in the plane, but the bear would just eat faster. Willie knew what had happened and departed the area to find assistance from authorities. State authorities returned to the area, flown by helicopter pilot Sam Egley. They hiked the short distance from the lakeshore to the campsite where they ran into the bear who was guarding his cache. The group was armed with various rifles and shotguns of substantial caliber and quickly dispatched the giant man-eater. A necropsy was performed on the 28-year-old bear, and tissues from both Tim and Amy were pulled from its stomach. The recovery party then turned to gathering up the remains of the lovers. Timothy's remains were significantly consumed, and his body was dismembered. His arms were completely separated from his body, and his torso was largely consumed. His spine, hip, and misshapen head were recovered. Amy's body was in similar but better condition. The pair were placed into recovery bags and loaded onto the plane for proper analysis by the coroner. The audio captured during the attack would help the authorities establish the above timeline and would be valuable evidence of the happenings. The recording of the attack was left in the possession of Jewel Palavac, who was advised to destroy it by documentarian Werner Herzog. 
The later appearance of what was claimed to be the audio tape appeared on the internet, revealing that Palavac had either sold it or it had been stolen from her possession and posted. I will not post a link to this audio file as I cannot verify its authenticity and out of respect for the living family of the deceased. As a former science teacher, I frequently use this incident to pose the question to my students, is this science? Before modern understanding, many naturalists would learn in a manner similar to Treadwell's practices. They would insert themselves into the animal's environment to capture observations and draw conclusions from them. I would like to know if you think Treadwell's practices were scientific or something else. Post it in your comments, please. Research ecologist Tom Smith was quoted as saying, Treadwell was breaking every park rule that there was in terms of distance to the bears, harassing wildlife, and interfering with natural processes. He also stated that Treadwell had been warned repeatedly and that this tragedy was not unpredictable. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the wilds of Alaska, just east of Denali National Park in the Talkeetna Mountains. The land is covered with alder and willow bushes, interrupted by tall stands of birches and pines. July is the dry season, if Alaska has one, and nearly 24 hours of daylight. This allows residents and visitors to get out and enjoy the natural scenery and wildlife. Our episode begins with a small group of boys attending a wilderness education program. The boys were soaking up their lessons while attending the National Outdoor Leadership School. NALS is a non-profit global wilderness school designed to develop leadership and environmental awareness in its attendees. Courses range in duration from a few weeks to a full year, and students can earn high school or college credit for successfully completing courses. Knowles was founded in 1965 and has taught thousands of young people how to adventure while they learn about their environment and sustainability. The 16-year-old boys of the group were Samuel Boas from Westport, Connecticut, Shane Garlock from Pittsford, New York, and Noah Allaire from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The 17-year-olds of the group were Joshua Berg from New City, New York, Samuel Gotzigan from Denver, Colorado, and Simeon Melman from Huntington, New York. The eldest of the group was 18-year-old Victor Martin from Richmond, California. The boys had honed many wilderness survival skills in their prior weeks and were in the last stretch of their trek. They were navigating through some very thick bushes as there was no distinct trail to follow to their waypoint. They were very watchful for bears and had been instructed that if they ran into one to drop and play dead until the bear left them alone. The boys were walking single file with Berg and Gotsigan leading the pack at around 8.30 in the evening. They decided to cross a creek to avoid walking through the thick bush any farther. Berg and Gotsigan saw some rustling in the bushes on the other side of the creek and a large brown bear emerged from the right of the rustling bushes. The boys found themselves in the worst case scenario for anyone in the backcountry. They'd encountered a sow and her cub. The boys were unarmed and the three adults in charge of the group were trailing far behind, attending another pack of seven boys who were lagging. The sow immediately attacked Gotsigan, knocking him to the ground with a swipe of her razor sharp claws. The boy immediately began kicking the bear in a feeble attempt to fend off the enraged mother, hell bent on protecting her cub. The bear then clamped her jaws on Gotsigan's head and bit him severely. Next, she clenched her teeth on each of his arms in turn, tearing his skin and muscle tissue with ease. Then she swatted and bit him in the chest, which broke two of his ribs and punctured one of his lungs. Gotsigan screamed and yelled the entire time he was being brutalized, as the bear snarled and growled at the same time. Then she focused her anger on Berg. She attacked him and bit him as well. She swatted him, raking her claws over his flesh and severely wounding him. Then she returned to Gotsigan once more. Then she backed off a bit and Gotsigan started yelling to activate the emergency locator beacon to signal for help. The attack happened so fast that the boys were sent into a state of confusion and terror. They had no time to pull out their bear spray that they had been equipped with just for this occasion. Next, the bear attacked Noah Allaire. He was attempting to activate the emergency beacon when the sow emerged from the brush and grabbed the boy and swatted him back and forth, tossing his head from side to side. His lung was punctured and he was left battered and confused from the chaos. Victor Martin was watching the fracas in stunned awe and the bear ran over and bit one of his legs just above the ankle before he could even react. Then she disappeared into the dense bush. As soon as she departed, it started raining as if signaling nature's regret regarding the occurrence. The boys had no idea if she was still lingering in the area, but started to understand their predicament and developed a plan. The boys with the least injuries began setting up camp and immediately began triaging their wounded comrades. They had learned the basics about wilderness first aid on their journey, and they administered first aid as best as they could given the circumstances. They shoved a plastic bag into one of the gaping wounds of Godsigan's chest and bandaged it with gauze. 
Back at the emergency dispatch office, the boy's beacon signal was received at 9.30 p.m. and a search and rescue team was organized. Alaska State Troopers were sent to the location indicated by the beacon as well. The rescue team finally located the boys holed up in their tent together at 2.45 a.m. They assessed the condition of the boys and decided that Gotsigan and Berg were in serious condition. The two boys were airlifted to Providence Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage and placed in intensive care. The remaining boys were flown out to the Talkeetna Airport and taken to the Matsu Medical Center in Palmer as their injuries were not life-threatening. A secondary rescue crew was set out to locate the rest of the students lingering behind with their three adult supervisors. The authorities stated this group was not even aware of the bear attack. They were also searching for the bear just in case the second group might encounter it as well. The rest of the expedition was canceled and the students and instructors were returned to the school's headquarters. School organizers indicated that in the entire 40-year history of the school, they had never had a bear mauling. Uninjured survivor of the bear attack, Shane Gerlock, said he is still haunted by the sounds of the attack etched into his memory. The screams of his friends and the growls of the bear echo in his mind. Authorities praise the character and decisiveness of the boys. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a Fognac Island off the coast of southern Alaska. This area is a temperate rainforest covered in the dense undergrowth of ferns and other bushes and plants that commonly close visibility to just a few yards. A very dangerous range to surprise, or be surprised, by a brown bear, especially one that is bent on revenge. The ground consists of a thick, moist layer of duff and moss, which can conceal even the largest of animals' footfalls from being heard, including those that belong to humans. Brothers Luke and Josh Randall worked at the Afognak Wilderness Lodge, with many years of experience stalking in this area in search of the giant brown bears the island is renowned for. The brothers had set out to find another gargantuan predator and enjoy the environment they so loved. They had led their client across the scenic landscape and had glassed and observed for the better part of the day. They had seen a few bears, but were looking for a particularly large-sized bear for this client. After all, if a hunter is going to spend several thousand dollars in travel, permit, and licensing, as well as guide fees, they want to bring home a trophy animal that they can be proud of. The men spotted a giant bear later in the day and watched it for some time before deciding it would be perfect. The brothers and their hunting client reviewed the layout of the area and decided on a route that would keep them concealed. A concealed approach is a must for fatal shot placement on an animal of this size and violent potential. This would preclude a shot from a long distance due to the potential of wounding the animal and reducing a humane, clean kill and harvest. The brown bears on this island are extremely robust, with their bodies featuring very thick hide draped over a second layer composed of fat and gristle designed to protect them from each other's claws and teeth during battle. Everyday life of these giant bears consists of claiming and defending breeding and feeding areas, so these protective layers are a must for their survival. Beneath this sheath of armor, they also have a thick, dense layer of muscle wrapped around very dense bone. Their protective body structure has been known to stop bullets from penetrating into their vital organs, so shot placement has to be perfect to take them down quickly. As the hunting group arrived at their location, they analyzed the shooting lane that would give them the best opportunity for a fatal shot. Their client prepared by setting in on his rest and drawing his sights upon the most vulnerable part of the bear before slowly squeezing the trigger. The deafening roar of the hunting rifle echoed off of the hillside as the massive brown bear reacted to the impact. The bear immediately headed into the bush for cover and protection. The men were confident in the location of the shot, but not certain. As the light began to fade, they assessed the possibility of tracking a bear that they were not convinced was dead, and they decided to wait until the morning and take up the tracking then. After a night's rest, the men returned to the site of the hunt. They found the bear's trail and began to follow it cautiously. They were pretty sure it was dead, but in a situation like this, it is better to err on the side of caution than to charge ahead and cause the bear to run again or create an even more dangerous scenario. The bear trail meandered through dense patches of a plant called Devil's Club, which is a broadleaf bush that is covered in thorns. Devil's Club grows in thick clumps and effectively reduces visibility to just a few yards, creating an environment in which close-range encounters are nearly unavoidable. 
The bear's blood trail eventually emerged from the Devil's Club and rounded a low hillside. The men continued following the blood and track trail until one of them glanced a few yards up the hill above the trail they were on. The massive Bruin was laying there, dead. They walked up to the bear and noticed the giant bear was buried in moss and duff to the point where only his head poked out. His head was resting on the ground and his gaze stared down the trail the men were approaching on. This raised the curiosity of the men and they completely examined the blood trail they arrived on. The men were extremely surprised to follow the blood trail past the point where they were, then up the hill a short distance and back toward where they found the bear. This bear had set up an ambush over his own back trail and buried himself to conceal his location to catch the hunters by surprise to exact his revenge. The hunters had a deep chill creep up their collective spine as they realized the thoughtfulness the bear had put into this ambush. They pulled the corpse of the bear and it didn't yet have rigor mortis. For those of you who may not know, rigor mortis is a temporary stiffening on a dead body which occurs a few hours after death and lasts for several hours or days, eventually subsiding. The bear's body was still pliable and flexible, meaning that it had died within the last hour or so. It had concealed itself under the moss and duff and died while lying in ambush for the hunters, a handful of yards from the trail it expected them to approach from. An animal this calculating and vengeful that plans out a very sophisticated way to gain an advantage over hunters is nothing short of brilliant. Critics of hunters who think that it isn't fair to pursue this magnificent and intelligent predator have to admit that confronting any bear with lethal firepower is the only way to even the playing field against such a cunning and clever animal. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode whisks us away to another waterfall, but this time it isn't Liard Hot Spring, though it has similar foreboding undertones. We are going to the Cherokee National Forest, which covers roughly 1,000 square miles in eastern Tennessee, about 22 miles east of a town called Cleveland. In the Chilhowee Recreation Area, there's a beautiful tumbling waterfall called Benton Falls that draws visitors the 1.5 miles up its steep trail. Its water cascades down a formation of rock that look eerily like stairs, almost as if they were designed by a craftsman. In this area, in the last few weeks, 42 bear sightings have been documented. The state of Tennessee is its own little patch of wild in the middle of a nation of modern. In the western part of the state, the Mississippi River Valley slopes up toward the Cumberland Plateau which breaks up into the Smoky Mountain foothills to the east. There are at least 50 different large tree species in this state and they include maple, hickory, ash, oak, and pine trees. The smaller trees here include serviceberry, pawpaw, alder, and several species of sumac. The list of berry bushes is too long to list here. The animals here include elk, white-tailed deer, and wild hogs. The predominant predators of this area include fox, coyotes, bobcats, cougars, and black bears. On Thursday, April 13, 2006, at around 4 p.m., 45-year-old mother Susan Chenkus was enjoying a planned trip to the above-indicated location as a sidetrack from visiting her son, Christopher, who attended Lee University in Cleveland. Susan was an alumni from Lee University, and she immensely enjoyed camping, hiking, and being in the woods nearby. The university and the area around it was a home to many fond memories for her. She never once saw a bear while she was there. Susan's 37-year-old husband, Robert Petrasek, had to work, so he stayed behind and didn't go on the trip with his family. She brought her children, 6-year-old Elora Petrasek and her 2-year-old brother, Lucas Kenkus, to Lake McCamey near Benton Waterfall for relaxing family time together. A few weeks before departing for this trip, Alora told her mother that she may go to heaven before her mother. Susan thought of this as an imaginative thought from an energetic child's mind. Susan told Alora that she was sure she would live many more years than her mommy, but we never know when it is our time to go to heaven, and that angels would be with her. Every night Susan snuggled her little girl and prayed before tucking her in. Alora's name means God is my light. She loved to wear skirts and dresses, especially the pink ones. She loved nature and animals, especially butterflies, and even got upset if her mom tried to swat flies. She often pretended to be a veterinarian, motivated by the thought of caring for and saving injured animals. As they played in the lake, Susan regaled the children with descriptions of Benton Waterfall, a short hike up the trail. She described its beauty and Alora begged to see it. Susan agreed, and Alora disappeared, dashing along the trail, eager to see the waterfall. 
They expected to be surrounded by the embracing greenery and lulled by the sounds of the waterfall, but what they didn't count on was that in nature there are many unexpected scenarios which are denuded of sentimentality and mercy. Along the trail there were several children playing alongside Susan's children, as it is an easy location to bring smaller children to. One of the visiting families was walking down the trail and away from the pond when a giant black bear suddenly appeared from the brush along the trail. They backed slowly down the trail and sounded the alarm of the bear's presence to the rest of the people there. Susan glanced up the hill and could see the bear around 100 feet away. She yelled out to her kids to come to her as it was time to go. As she gathered her children, the 350 to 400 pound black bear quickly ran through the brush to their location. It had hidden back in the bushes along the trail and paralleled the trail to appear alongside the family in an ambush of its prey. A few of the adults present recognized the danger the bear posed to the group and began yelling and shouting in an attempt to drive the bear off. As the bear approached the group, children and adults began to panic and run in every direction like a covey of quail flushed from brush. As two-year-old Lucas was a little less scared than the rest, he made an easy target for the massive black bear. It quickly scaled a fence and opened its jaws and bit onto his head, driving its canine teeth through his skull. Susan immediately grabbed her son and began pulling Lucas to get him away from the bear. The others were throwing stones and hitting the bear with sticks to drive it off, but it was focused on Susan and Lucas. After wrestling her son from the bear's jaws, she stared at the bear, silently praying that it would leave. As soon as she was convinced it would back down, she turned around to retreat safely with her children. The bear took the opportunity to attack her. It bit onto the back of her neck, puncturing it several times with its teeth and claws as it pulled her to the ground. Susan yelled to the bystanders to save her children. Overwhelmed with the terror of the event, Susan could do nothing to resist the power of the giant bear as it chewed on her and dragged her off the trail a few yards. She could hear the bones of her neck crunching under the immense pressure of the apex predator's powerful and dangerous jaws. Susan indicated that she silently prayed at that point that God would make her unconscious, and she immediately blacked out. In all of the confusion caused by the appearance of the bear, Elora went unnoticed as she fled down the trail and away from her mother. Due to the noise and resistance raised by the people at the pond, the bear dropped Susan from its jaws and disappeared once again into the brush. A member of the family that was initially confronted by the bear used their cell phones to reach out to authorities. They organized a way to get Susan and Lucas out of the area to a trailhead for first responders to begin life-saving measures, and carried the two from the woods. When Susan regained consciousness, she immediately asked if her son and daughter were okay. That is when the first responders realized that Alora was missing. Rescue workers flooded into the site to search for her immediately. Susan and Lucas were transported by helicopter to Erlanger Health System in Chattanooga. As their rescuers were transporting her and her son out, they saw a bear up on the hill above them in a thicket. Danny Stinnett was the chief of the West Polk Fire and Rescue Department and was one of the first responders to arrive at the scene. Chief Stinnett and other first responders found Susan. As others worked on Susan, Stinnett took his thirty-eight caliber pistol and crawled through brush uphill from the attack site. He had only traveled about 100 yards when he came face to face with a huge black bear. The bear was guarding the body of Alora and immediately charged toward the chief. He fired his pistol twice at the charging bear, and it immediately stood up on its hind legs in reaction to the impact and pain of at least one of his bullets, and then quickly disappeared into the brush once again. Stinnett was convinced he hit the bear and knew that it would continue to seek out more people for food, especially since it was now injured. The rescuers immediately removed their shirts and covered Alora's body with them. One even stood guard over her body to make sure the bear didn't return to carry her remains off. Susan had eight puncture wounds to her neck, as well as many claw and bite injuries all over her body. The medical staff said her wounds numbered too many to count. She rested in a drug-induced coma for nine days while undergoing treatment for her wounds. She was in critical condition at the medical center and underwent seven surgeries to repair damaged tissues. 
Her left thigh and right arm were severely scarred with huge gouge marks from the bear's teeth. She had to go through physical therapy to learn how to use her left arm again. She also lost two major blood vessels in her neck and could only talk in a whisper for a long time. Lucas was in serious but stable condition from the bite wound to his head. The bite piercing his skull healed quickly. Immediately following the attack, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency brought search dogs out to the attack site. They scoured the area in search of the bear's scent trail for one day, but couldn't find one. They next brought out culvert traps as well as snares and baited them with sticky buns and donuts and set up a one and a half mile radius around the attack site. They knew the bear might attack someone else or flee the area altogether to menace or threaten people again later. Time was of the essence in finding this bear and removing its threat to people. On April 16th, the bear was caught near the attack site. Believed to be the predatory bear, it was put down upon capture and its carcass was sent to the veterinary school at the University of Tennessee. It was found to be a male that weighed a little over 200 pounds, which is slightly larger than average spring weight. It was noted to be in good condition and had a regular amount of fat deposits in its muscles. It wasn't emaciated or starving. The bear's digestive system was not found to contain human remains or clothing due to too much time having elapsed since the attack. When its claws and paws were analyzed for DNA evidence, this bear was found to have had nothing to do with the death of Alora. On April 17th, a second bear was captured near the perimeter of the trap area in a leg hold snare. It was transported alive to a holding center for analysis. The FBI analyzed this bear's claws for DNA and found Alora's DNA on its claws. It was immediately euthanized and its carcass underwent a necropsy to search for any aggravating health issues that may be linked to the cause of the attack. This bear was also much nearer the reported weight of the giant black bear who attacked Susan and her family. The officials continued to monitor the area for bear activity until May 1st, but found nothing. Having determined that the bear responsible for Elora's death had been killed, the remaining traps were deactivated and removed. Rangers at the Cherokee National Forest commented that black bears typically avoid human contact or presence, citing that bears detect our presence well before we detect theirs. They note that aggressive behavior in bears can sometimes be caused by disease, parasites, or tumors. There was no source I could find that indicated the final analysis of the attacking bear's condition. Bear researchers postulated that the black bear may have recently emerged from hibernation and was hungry enough to pursue humans. They also thought it was possible that the bear acted in a territorial manner due to the presence of other competing males in its territory. Since the year 2000, there have been two fatal bear attacks in Tennessee, both being on female people. There have been 56 documented human fatalities from black bears in the last 100 years. North America is reported to have around 750,000 black bears. Around 1,500 black bears currently live in Cherokee National Forest. An investigation determined the attack to be an unprovoked predatory attack. Officials note that bear attacks are rare, but predatory attacks are the most difficult to predict and avoid. Nearly two years later to the day, Susan returned to the site of her and her son's attack and Alora's death. Forestry workers that accompanied her pointed out the location where they found her bleeding and asked for help. They showed her where Alora's body was found and hoped that confronting her fears surrounding this trauma may be healed, at least in part, by her visit. Lucas had accompanied his mother on this return to the falls and entertained himself by jumping from rock to rock searching for fish. He was oblivious to the prior trauma seemingly, and that pleased Susan to see. Accompanied by her father and her son, the Chenkis stepped off to the side to say a prayer of gratitude and healing together. Upon returning to the church which her father pastored, he called her up to the stage to lead worship. She unsteadily walked her way up and wondered silently how she was going to do this, but she did. Many of the congregation wept as she quietly led them in a chorus of, Great is your faithfulness. The pain of losing her daughter was crippling at times, and when her grief overcame her, she crept into Alora's pink bedroom to weep. 
She decided to focus her life on living for her daughter and worked hard to rehabilitate herself and live with gratitude and allowing herself time to grieve the loss of her daughter. Robert, Susan's husband, dealt with his grief privately while running the household during her grieving periods. Susan researched how families who experienced grief helped in their healing by serving others. She states that that is the key to healing from wounds like losing a child. This episode was hard to research and even harder to write and compile. The episodes that involved the death or injury of children always seemed to hit hardest. After reviewing the details of this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think this bear attack may have been avoided if someone at the waterfall had been carrying a firearm or bear spray? Why do you think Alora told her mommy that she would be in heaven before her mother? Do you think the bear left Susan to pursue Alora? Did the authorities actually kill the predatory bear, or did they get the wrong one? I will be glad to read your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to a place we have visited on several previous episodes and for similar reasons. Just outside of Anchorage is the Wrangell, St. Elias Park and Preserve. In fact, Anchorage sprawls right up the edge of the wilderness area and creates a zone where bears and humans have a high likelihood of running into each other. The mountains to the south and east of Anchorage are the Chugach Range and are impressive, beautiful, and foreboding. The forest canopy here is a mix of aspens, pine, fir, birch, and spruce trees and alder as well as willows crowding the banks of every body of water. The peaks are dotted with dolls, sheep, and mountain goats visible from downtown Anchorage on a clear day. Moose, caribou, and sitka black-tailed deer may be seen amongst the dense foliage and lush mountainsides in the Chugach. Dominant predators in the area include wolves, coyotes, black bears, as well as brown bears. It is in this beautiful scene in which our episode takes place today. On June 19, 2018, 44-year-old civil engineer Mike Soltis was just putting some chicken in the sink to thaw for dinner around 4.30 in the afternoon. Mike worked for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium overseeing and designing rural water projects around the state. He was a lifelong resident of Eagle River and loved to go wandering through the forest around it all by himself. His life had just turned a corner for the good. Mike and his girlfriend, Elizabeth Claus, had just gotten engaged and found out she was carrying their baby. Elizabeth was a brigade judge advocate for the U.S. Army and was excited about moving in with Mike soon so that they could prepare for the birth of their child in November. The successful couple's futures were looking very promising as they slowly intertwined their lives. After putting the chicken and water in the sink, Mike donned his gray sweatshirt and tennis shoes. Nature was beckoning him and he would gladly answer her call. He answered a text, then out the door he went. He was very experienced at hiking in the area, and no source indicated he had taken bear spray nor a firearm with him on this hike. Mike hiked along the myriad of trails that wind their way through his higher-end subdivision. His home was a short distance from the end of Highland Road, which formed a dead end at the upper portion of South Fork of the Eagle River Valley. After that, hiking trails took over and meandered through brush and slope. But hikers are not the exclusive users of hiking trails. By Tuesday afternoon, no one had heard from Mike. Sean Railt, one of Mike's close friends, decided to go up to Mike's home and check in on him. Upon arriving, he entered Mike's home and called for his friend and looked through the home. Sean could see the chicken still in the sink but couldn't find Mike anywhere. There was no note and his vehicle was sitting in the driveway, so he had to be nearby. Sean went outside and walked the property looking for Mike or a clue to his whereabouts but found nothing. With growing concern, Sean immediately called everybody that he could think of that might have insight into Mike's location. This network of friends and family quickly posted on social media and communicated to form a search party. Mike's father hired a private helicopter and pilot to search from the air as foot searchers converged on his last known location. His close friends and family reacted quicker than the authorities and began searching without them. By Wednesday morning, several groups of ground searchers arrived and devised a plan to walk the trails of the subdivision and try to find Mike. 51-year-old Paul Vasquez was searching alongside Mike's cousin, Wendy Yeoman. 
Wendy was walking with the other searchers when she felt an urge to go down a small ravine and look for Mike there. Knowing that searchers must stay together and seeing Wendy headed in that direction, Vasquez began to walk toward her. She began to walk around a steep hillside when she heard a noise only a few yards from her location. She glanced up and saw an enormous brown bear blurring toward her through the brush. Vasquez only had time to take a few steps to place himself between Wendy and the charging bear, which stopped the bear from attacking Wendy, but it focused its anger on him instead. The bear clamped its jaws on Vasquez's leg and shook its head from side to side. It wrapped its massive claws around his lower leg and pulled him toward itself, eliminating his escape. Its teeth drove deep into the flesh of Vasquez's leg as he screamed in pain. Vasquez was pulled to the ground when the bear briefly disappeared into the bushes. As Vasquez tried to crawl away, the bear emerged once again to resume its attack on him briefly. Wendy could only look on in desperation while she screamed for help. A small group of searchers sprinted toward Wendy's screams and drove the bear off of Vasquez and back into the surrounding bushes. Vasquez's leg wounds were serious and the searchers began to bandage his leg with a tourniquet to slow the bleeding. They quickly devised a plan to get him back to the road and loaded him into one of the searchers' vehicles. Vasquez was driven to the nearest hospital for emergency medical treatment. The authorities immediately announced that anyone in the area should stay away from the attack scene due to the bear's aggression. Once the searchers were removed from the area, APD officers arrived on scene and began searching for the bear. Upon returning to Vasquez's attack location about 20 yards away, they found the remains of Mike Soltis. The bear had claimed his body as food and buried it under sticks and duff. His body had been cached by the bear and it had already demonstrated its intentions to defend it by attacking Vasquez. A recovery team gathered Mike's remains and solemnly packed them past several nice homes along the road. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game knew they would have to catch this bear and kill it. It had already attacked Vasquez and may have killed Soltis as well. They were reluctant to label Mike's attack as predatory because there was a chance he may have had a heart attack or another health emergency while hiking, and the bear merely scavenged his body afterward. Mike's remains were taken to the coroner's office for examination and cause of death findings. Fish and game officials combed the area, searching for the giant brown bear. They set out foothold traps in an attempt to snare it so they could tranquilize it for examination. If they ran into an aggressive bear and killed it, they may not have killed the bear that had been responsible, so a snare would be the best bet for finding the right bear. They also set out game cameras and did capture a grainy photo of a brown bear overnight, but could not locate that bear the next day. The foothold snares they had set out had managed to catch three black bears over a month's time, but they were released. DNA evidence pulled from Mike's body determined that the brown bear that killed him was a female and was involved in his as well as Vasquez's attack. Although cubs were not reported by any witnesses, they were not ruled out either. A brown bear study conducted in Alberta, Canada revealed that two-thirds of all cubs born to sows known to act aggressively toward humans become problem bears as well. They say that aggressiveness in general, but specifically toward humans, may be a behavior sows pass on to their cubs while they are reared. The study goes on to say that culling problem bears before they can reproduce may be a very good option to consider for cities like Anchorage. The Alaska Fish and Game report that they react to bear attacks on humans on a case-by-case -case basis. This means that if the bear exhibited predatory behavior, it would be viewed in a much more serious light than a bear defending its cubs, or a food cache. The prevailing strategy used by the Alaska Fish and Game in these types of situations is to tranquilize any and all bears they catch in the foothold snares and take blood for DNA analysis. Before releasing the bear, it is collared for tracking purposes. Due to the fact that Soltis and Vasquez's attacks happened around a rural housing development, an unacceptable risk to residents was deemed possible and the culling of any brown bears in the area would not harm populations. Alaska Fish and Game reports that there are estimated to be 250 to 350 black bears and 55 to 65 brown bears living within Anchorage's sprawling 1,958 square mile municipal boundaries. Mike Soltis's death was the sixth fatal bear attack in the last six years in Alaska. 
After reviewing the tragic and unexpected details of this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think that Mike's attack was predatory or defensive in nature? Do you think a well-established bear hazing program would have prevented this attack? Did the sow attack because she was protecting her cubs? Are you surprised that a brown bear was found living right next to a human housing development? Do you think this sow learned hostility toward humans from her mother while she was a cub? I will be glad to read and answer your thoughts, so make sure to post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to what seems like, to me, an unlikely location for a bear attack. When someone mentions New Mexico, you probably think of the arid deserts and Spanish architecture that characterize the majority of the state. The last thing I think of is giant black bears. Well, the last thing I think of is leopard seals, but black bears are right up there on the list. Just south of the good side of the Colorado border lies a small town called Raton. To the northwest of the city is a broad expanse of rolling wooded mountains packed with elk and deer. The pine, spruce, and juniper stands cover the land like an emerald blanket and provide shade and shelter for predator and prey alike. There are cougars, gray wolves, coyotes, foxes, and somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 black bears. On the morning of July 25, 2018, local rancher Bridger Petrini was taking his bear hunting dogs out for a stroll. The fall bear season in New Mexico was a few weeks away, and he and his dogs were fine-tuning their skills. Bridger's father was a licensed professional guide in New Mexico. He started the business in 1985 and about eight years ago sold it to Bridger to keep it in the family. Since then, Bridger had been the driving force behind the success of his family's guide service and later on in the day he had some business in town to tend to. Bridger led his dogs away from their home, down a rural road meandering through the junipers. There were many animals near his home, and it wasn't rare to see them or have his dogs react to them. He lived in this home with his wife, Janelle, and their four children. The kids experienced an embrace of nature many children never feel. As his dogs sniffed and explored, they came across a familiar scent along the road. Their ears perked up, and they suddenly bolted from the roadside and into the tree, baying as they went. Bridger knew this was the behavior they exhibited when they were on a bear scent trail and was immediately alarmed at what he knew was to come. When hunting bears with hounds, the dogs are typically bound in kennels to keep them from obeying their training and breed instincts. They are bred to immediately and continuously pursue a bear until it is treed or cornered so that humans can either kill it or pull them off of the scent trail and back to their kennels. Without direct control over the dogs, this action was unstoppable until the chase culminated in the bear being treed or cornered. Hearing the commotion from the house, Bridger's ten-year-old son, whom we will call Daniel, yelled out to his father. He asked if he could help his dad round up the dogs and received an affirming reply, as well as instructions to bring the Kawasaki mule for the pair to ride on as they followed the baying hounds. In just a few moments, Daniel showed up as his father directed him to. Bridger had brought his cell phone along, but wasn't packing a firearm or bear spray. Janelle called him and asked him to come back and pick up his sister so that she could see a bear for the first time. Bridger knew this situation was not ideal, and told Janelle that the dogs had to be pulled off the bear's scent trail immediately to avoid injury to any animals involved. Daniel and his father put it along on the mule to finish rounding up their hounds. Janelle and Bridger's sister hopped into the family vehicle, a Toyota Tacoma, and began following the pursuit as best they could from the road. Janelle packed the three kids and Bridger's sister in the truck and departed the home, knowing that they may be able to see the bear at some point and would be able to reach Bridger and Daniel on the cell phone as they searched. Given the altitude of 6,500 feet and the moderate temperatures on the day, the bear and the dogs were soon tired. It was in the upper 80s, and that is fairly warm for this high up, so the conditions took their toll on the critters quickly. When hounds pursue a bear, it will try to run away or find a tree to climb. In the event it cannot find an escape in either of those ways, it will eventually turn around and stand its ground to fight its pursuers. This is exactly what happened beneath a rocky outcropping. 
Bridger could tell by the way the dogs bayed that the bear was not moving anymore, and knew that this may be a good chance to gather his hounds, so he and Daniel hurried to the location as quickly as the mule would carry them. As Bridger and Daniel approached the standoff, Bridger instructed Janelle and the occupants of the truck to park a ways away as he pulled the hounds off. He had pulled hounds off of scent trails and cornered animals many times before and didn't expect this time to be any different. He wasn't prepared like he would be when he was hunting with a client, but had to do what was necessary in less than ideal circumstances. Before Bridger returned to the bear and hounds, he reached inside his truck and pulled out his Glock Model 20 10mm pistol and stuffed it beneath his belt. Bridger's pistol was his standard sidearm when he guided bear hunting clients. He loaded it with 175 grain Hornady critical duty flex lock bullets. This bullet is a hollow point round with a special polymer filler in the hole. This feature is designed to keep the bullet from being pulled apart by fibrous materials like clothing or hair. The bullet will penetrate further into flesh before opening up and mushrooming, imparting its force deeper into tissues instead of just beneath the skin. This allows the bullet to penetrate around 18 inches of flesh, wreaking havoc on anything living its impact. This particular round is designed with reduced recoil to allow for faster and more accurate shooting and is deliberately designed with less power than a typical 10mm round. As Bridger turned around and headed back toward the bear and hounds, his daughter tried to follow him but was called back by Janelle to the safety of the truck. As Bridger trudged along his path, the countless times he had seen Black Bear turn tail and run at the sight or scent of a man emboldened him. He expected nothing different this day and hoped to soon have his schedule and plans back on track. Across this small, flat area were strewn kitchen appliance-sized boulders, which Bridger used to bound across in his approach. As he rounded a low-growing cedar tree, his hounds and the bear came into view. He was now only about 20 feet from one of the bigger, cinnamon-colored black bears he had ever seen. His experience told him this bear weighed around 400 pounds and was unique for the area. Bridger considered pulling his cell phone out and recording the bear for his own records, but that is when everything this experienced bear hunting guide knew betrayed him and would put him in a perilous confrontation with this bear. Some people say bears are a lot like people. Each one has its own reaction to any particular stimulus. People are unpredictable, but bears are unpredictable and much more dangerous. As soon as the bear locked eyes with Bridger, it pinned its ears back and lowered its head. He knew this meant that this bear was focusing its anger on him and that wasn't a good thing. He immediately dropped his cell phone and reached for his Glock in his waistband. It has been reported by people who experience terrifying situations that their brain goes into a hyperdrive of sorts. Fast events are somehow slowed down and every detail is magnified and analyzed by those who experience this phenomenon. As he watched the bear's paws stretch out toward him, initiating a charge, Bridger knew this was not a situation to fire warning shots. The bear was too close for half measures and too large to dismiss its intentions. His mind quickly determined that if he fired at the bear's head and missed, he might shoot one of his dogs, but aiming at the massive body of the bear was his best bet. He quickly fired three rounds, center mass, toward the bear as it took its next few bounds toward him. The bullets hit home, and the bear reacted in pain and anger. It spun in circles, biting at the searing bullet burrowing into its flesh, a mere six feet from the muzzle of Bridger's pistol. Seeing the bear temporarily distracted by the pain and impact of the bullets, Bridger decided to put more room between himself and the bear. He managed to hop from boulder to boulder. Midway through his third leap to the next boulder, he witnessed his hounds racing past him. He knew that this was because they were being pursued by the now wounded and enraged bear. As he landed on the third boulder, he spun to face the bear and saw its eyes still fixed on his and filled with anger. He could see the muscles rippling beneath its thick hide and fur. His mind processed every detail how its claws slapped the ground as they dug in while it bounded toward him, and how its teeth glistened from the saliva frothing from its mouth. Bridger didn't even have enough time to pull the trigger again before the bear bowled into him. It tackled him like a furry NFL linebacker, and the pair tumbled down the rocky slope. As they rolled down the hill, the bear continued its focused attack with uninterrupted intensity. 
It seemed to process every detail even faster than Bridger's mind could comprehend. He fired his pistol a few times as they tumbled, but later didn't recall firing any. He grasped his Glock as if his life depended on it, as it clearly did. As they wrestled while falling down the slope, they broke tree branches and smashed their way through the brush in a chaotic flash of teeth, claws, and belabored grunts. They eventually came to rest, wedged between a few larger boulders. Bridger's arms and legs were all tangled up with the bears, and he quickly worked to free himself. Bridger knew his Glock held about twelve rounds in the clip. He knew he had fired three shots at the bear initially, but didn't recall firing a few during the tumble. As the bear rose to its hind legs, Bridger believed he should still have around nine rounds left in his Glock. With the bear now only one foot away from the muzzle of his pistol, he fired into its chest before slipping further down the slope once again. When he finally stopped sliding, Bridger yelled toward Janelle to stay away and keep the kids away. The bear was once again on him before he could process it. Bridger stretched his legs up and kicked at the bear as it tried to straddle him with its front legs. He knew the bear would try to use its weight to hold him down so that it could bite his body, neck, or head. He fought for all his worth to prevent this from happening. He had the wherewithal to know that he couldn't shoot it while he flailed his legs at it. Bridger kicked at the bear's head and the bear dodged it. Its head was now between his legs and it sank its one and one half inch canines into the flesh of his inner thigh muscle. The bear easily picked him up a few feet in the air as Bridger pressed the muzzle of his pistol into the fur of its neck. He knew if he could shatter its spine it may immobilize the bear. He squeezed the trigger and the bear released its grip on his thigh. The bear didn't fall over, immobilized as Bridger had hoped, and quickly latched its jaws onto his right calf muscle. He saw a great opening for a headshot in the bear and pressed the muzzle into its fur once again and pulled the trigger. Instead of hearing the roar of another round fired, Bridger heard a disheartening click. The bear continued its attack on him as he racked another round into the chamber of his pistol, watching a live round slowly spin from his Glock. It was a fraction of a second before another close headshot was offered by the bear as it tried to tear the flesh of his calf muscle from bone. Again, Bridger pressed his Glock against the fur of the bear head and squeezed the trigger. This time a resounding clap roared from his Glock. The bear collapsed partially on top of Bridger, and the shift in weight sent both sliding down the slope once again. Bridger was face down with his head pointed downhill as they stopped sliding on the steep rock slope. The bear was above him and lay in a motionless massive ball of splayed legs. Bridger tried to pull himself free from the bear, but its jaws were still tightly clamped onto his calf muscle. As they had tumbled and slid the last time, Bridger's flesh had become twisted around the bear's nose, preventing its jaws from releasing. Bridger was pinned between two boulders, and each time he tried to move, pain seared through his leg as the bear's immense size and clamped jaws stretched his calf muscle and flesh to its limits. He felt consciousness fading each time he tried to pull his leg free from the bear's teeth. Due to how he was contorted after the last fall, he couldn't see the bear. He reached his hand behind him and felt the bear's teeth with something moist in between them. He could feel his calf muscle still pinched between the bear's teeth. He couldn't move to free himself and was held in this hopeless position. Back at the truck, Janelle heard the shots fired by Bridger as well as his screams. She knew this was bad and couldn't hold back her need to help and make sure her husband was safe. She fought the children's desire to run to their father's aid and ordered them to remain in the truck with her. After a few seconds of unnerving silence, Janelle yelled at her husband and asked where the bear was. She was relieved to hear Bridger's reply that the bear was dead. Janelle and the kids all streamed from the truck and scurried around the slope to Bridger's side. Janelle could now see how the bear's jaws were wrapped in Bridger's flesh, forcing them closed. She tried to free his calf from the bear's jaws, but each time she moved any part of him or the bear, it caused Bridger to recoil in pain. The bear was far too massive for her to move and was wedged between boulders, holding it fast. Janelle immediately began placing call after call on her cell phone. She called the police and then went through their entire contact list of family and friends whom she thought may be able to help. She gathered the children together and prayed for help and peace over the situation. Within about twenty minutes, five of their friends had shown up to help. As strong as they were, they were unable to dislodge the bear from its wedged location due to its immense size. 
Between the brush and boulders holding the bear, the men had to search for another way to get this bear to release its grip. Janelle's brother, Brad, was one of the men who responded to Janelle's calls for help. He grabbed Bridger's pocket knife, which was a three-inch griptilian made by Benchmade. As you can see by the picture, this is not a large knife, but Brad began to slice away at the bear's neck in an attempt to cut off its head. The hope was that if they couldn't move the bear's massive body, maybe they could sever its head and untangle Bridger's flesh from its snout that way. When the flesh and hide were cut clear, Brad used a bone saw to finish severing the bear's head. Now with the bear's huge head freed from its body, the men labored to untwist its jaws from Bridger's calf muscle. As soon as the last stretch tissues were untwisted, the bear's jaws popped open and Bridger's calf was released. It was now gray in color from lack of blood supply and trauma. The previous January, a helicopter crash had occurred very near to this bear attack site, and Bridger was the first person on the scene. He held two of the victims in his arms as their life passed. What he saw had traumatized him and caused him to swear off ever flying in a helicopter, but life has a funny way of making each of us eat our own words. As the rescue helicopter broke the silence with its approach, Bridger began to become upset. He loudly objected to the idea of being flown out and yelled out loud, I'm not getting on that thing. Due to the stress and trauma of the situation, Bridger began to go into a state of shock and convulsed. It was probably better for him to lose consciousness than face too many of his own fears after all he had experienced that day. As the female responder loaded Bridger into the helicopter, he looked up and told her he didn't want to ride in the helicopter. She calmly told him that she would make him a little more comfortable and reach across his chest and tightened a belt holding him on the gurney. She leaned down and whispered in his ear, Honey, you don't have a choice. She quickly placed an IV in his arm and began to administer morphine to ease his pain. As soon as it took effect, Bridger said, Let's go. After a helicopter flight through turbulent weather, Bridger and the crew safely arrived at a trauma center with a specialization in animal attacks. He underwent four hours of surgery to clean and close several bite wounds on his right thigh and calf muscle and suffered innumerable bruises and abrasions from the tumble down the hill. He received just over 200 stitches in the process. The pictures of Bridger's wounds and the dead bear are not fit for YouTube standards, so I have posted them on my Patreon account linked below. I do warn you, they are graphic, and there is a picture of a severed bear head there, so if you are unable to stomach those kinds of images, don't look at them. He had to go through weeks of painful physical rehabilitation and was laid up for the bear season while he recovered. He suffered long-term tissue and nerve damage in his right leg, but survived, all due to the fact that he grabbed his Glock with the Hornady rounds. Although Bridger's bear attack only lasted about 20 seconds, the effects of it will last a lifetime. Once he was able to check out his Glock, Bridger found bear hair between the guide rod and the slide of the pistol. This prevented the slide from returning to the firing position on the round that misfired. In order to get bear hair into this part of the gun, it would have to be fired at close enough proximity for the slide to move forward and trap bear fur inside the mechanics of the gun. Thankfully, Bridger was aware and able enough to chamber a new round to bring his bear attack to an end. After examining the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Why do you think this bear did not do what so many other bears do and run for its life when it saw Bridger? Do you think this bear was exhausted and frustrated enough by the dogs that it took out its angst on Bridger? Do you think bear spray may have prevented this bear attack? What do you think Bridger could have done differently to avoid this attack? I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comment section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for- Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to rugged and scenic Indian, Alaska, just south of the state's largest city of Anchorage. The steep mountains of the Chugach Range jut nearly straight out of the ground, it seems. The land is covered in pine and fir trees, as well as alder, tall blueberry, and devil's club. The area features 30% of all plant species in Alaska, so the fauna present is very diverse. White doll sheep and mountain goats can be seen on the tops of the mountains from downtown Anchorage, as nature has a way of pushing into civilization here. It's very common to see moose, brown bear, black bear, and various other wildlife along the highways around the area. This is a place where the boundary between the rigors of the life animals live and human existence are blurred and nearly inseparable. 
The Robert Spur Memorial Hill Climb at Bird Ridge was celebrating its 29th year and featured a 3,400-foot climb. The trail meanders through woods and hills and is a local favorite event for running enthusiasts. Bird Ridge is a trail just off the Seward Highway at around 14 miles from the south edge of Anchorage. On Father's Day, June 18, 2017, Patrick Cooper, a 16-year-old boy who had just completed his sophomore year, was running the trail with his mother, Katrina. He was running in the youth division of the race and she in the adult division. Before they left, Patrick grabbed his cell phone and his mother switched her phone to airplane mode to save battery life. Patrick had just completed the 1.5 mile junior uphill portion of the race when his mother called him her little mountain goat and hugged him before she continued up the hill to finish the adult portion. Patrick was a happy and energetic boy who loved hugs and smiling. He enjoyed being outdoors and running. He was looking forward to shooting hockey goals with his friend after he finished his run with his mom. He was born premature and had some disabilities, but his congenial personality was undeniable. His biological parents had given him up for adoption after finding out he had a seizure disorder, autism, and ADHD. He was adopted by Katrina and her husband at the time, David. He was extremely gregarious despite his autism. The Bird Ridge Run would be his third race of this year. With his portion of the race finished, Patrick was slow hiking back down the trail with a small group of youth runners. The kids were chatting and laughing and not paying any attention as they were done with the hard part. As the group hiked down, Patrick lost focus for a few seconds at a confusing juncture in the trail. He headed off on a fork of the trail that was not on the race circuit and nobody was walking on. He was only a short distance down the trail when he noticed some rustling in the bush near him. Patrick figured it was no big deal, but finally noticed the others were not near him anymore. As he paused to look for the other joggers, he noticed a large black bear looking at him from a short distance away. The bear was between where he had come from and where he was. Now he only had one way to go, further down the trail and away from the others of his group. As Patrick would walk, the bear would stalk up closer. The boy was scared by this and began running. The bear followed suit. Patrick became very alarmed and wanted to speak with his mother. Taking his cell phone out, he dialed her number but got her voicemail. He kept a careful eye on the bear as he tried to put distance between the two. He texted his mother and his brother but got no response. He repeated the texting and reaching out as his fear mounted. He left a few voicemails describing that he was afraid because he had a bear chasing him and he didn't know what to do. Katrina finished her run down the hill and went to the muster point where she told the boys to meet after the race. She looks over and sees Patrick's water bottle and raincoat and immediately has a sense of foreboding. He was supposed to pick that up and take it with him when he came down the hill, and he should have been down well before her. That's when Patrick's brother Jesse ran up to Katrina. He had just retrieved his phone from his backpack and noticed several messages from Patrick, indicating that a bear was chasing him. Suddenly a fog of family, friends, and volunteers started dashing up the mountain while Patrick's brother Jason went down the hill to find more help. Jesse managed to frantically dial Patrick's phone number and he answered. He was terrified and asked his brother what to do. Men in the crowd surrounding Jesse and overhearing the conversation offered advice on how to stand up to the bear and intimidate it. They called 911 and tried to triangulate Patrick's location, but the cell coverage was too intermittent to accurately do so. The call dropped and Patrick could not be reached again. The search party didn't know precisely where he was, so they fanned out and scoured as much area as they could. The last person to see him indicated where it was that Patrick veered off the trail. John Weddleton had branched off from the main part of the search party when he heard a noise above him on the trail. Suddenly, a large black bear came toward him to about ten feet away. John looked over and saw Patrick lying on the ground, bitten and motionless. Armed park rangers soon arrived at Patrick's location and confronted the bear. It was guarding Patrick's body. The rangers used shotgun slugs and shot the bear in the face. The big bear disappeared into the surrounding brush, leaving a blood trail. The rangers reclaimed Patrick's body from the bear and flew his remains out by helicopter. Patrick's friends miss him dearly, and his mother still folds his clothes. Authorities note this attack as a predatory attack. Alaska state biologists returned to the area and used planes and helicopters to shoot four bears. They feared the bears might run off if they used tranquilizer darts and they would lose them. One of the bears they shot, a 250-pound male, had been shot by a shotgun slug in the face. They were confident they killed the bear that killed Patrick. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the nearly impenetrable hardwood forests of the Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. 
The landscape here was shaped by untold eons of glacial activity, leaving behind rolling landscapes, small cliffs, and rich soils. Beavers bob along the lakes and ponds as they chew branches to build their lodges. The dense forests of sugar maple, hemlock, and yellow birch hide moose and white-tailed deer, and the common predators of the area are wolves and black bear. It is in this setting that today's episode takes place. In May 1978, 18-year-old Richard Rindris and his 16-year-old brother, William, invited 12-year-old George Hafkeny and his 14-year-old brother, Mark, out for a great day on the lake, fishing at Radiant Lake. The early summer sun bounced off the ripples, confirming its name. The boys spent the morning running up and down the lake shore, casting their bait into promising fishing holes and laughing together. Their campfire kept them warm as the summer sun heated the day and lit up the beautiful green foliage surrounding them. The fish were hungry and big, and the boys ran their stringer through the gills of each of the fish they caught, then ran off to catch the next one. As the day wore on and the afternoon faded, there was a very subtle shift in the shadows. From the dense brush, a large black bear watched the young men laugh and holler while they fished. Being an amazing ambush predator, well camouflaged for stalking the dark shadows of thick forests, the bear no doubt analyzed every approach alley to sneak upon the boys and still remain concealed. The boys had spread out a bit as the evening approached and George was hidden around a bend in the shoreline. The visual contact the boys had maintained all day had relaxed a bit, and the fun had reduced their watchfulness. George quietly readied his hook for another cast into the clear, cold waters, but was unaware that he had become the object of a hungry visitor's fascination. As George cast his bait, then waited impatiently for a bite, the large black bear slipped silently through the growing shadows to within a few yards of him. The leaves on the forest floor were several months old and had decomposed through a freezing winter which robbed them of their crunch and rustling. The bear's approach was virtually silent to the unaware young fisherman. In a blinding ambush from behind the boy, the bear quickly broke his neck and ended his life in terror. With George's death, his stretch of the shore was eerily silent. Mark and William were a little ways away, but started to grow concerned when they hadn't heard from George for a while. The two boys began calling his name, but received no answer. It seemed possible he was a little farther away than they thought, so they continued to yell, louder this time. After an extended bout of yelling and hollering, the boys decided to investigate George's whereabouts. They made their way along the shoreline for a while, but couldn't find a trace of George. Unbeknownst to the young men, the bear undoubtedly heard their voices and listened as they approached George's body, now being claimed as its food. The bear slipped into the shadows toward the boys to intercept them while they were unaware. George's brother Mark began walking a worn trail away from the shoreline to investigate in an attempt to find any sign of his brother. As he delved deeper into the forest, the light faded and bushes closed in around the trail. The bear ambushed him quickly in a similar way it did George and broke his neck. His death was quick and merciful. The bear now had two dead bodies from which to feed, but the horror wasn't over yet. William was only a few dozen yards away and heard the commotion of the attack on Mark. It's apparent he wasn't alarmed at the noise as it didn't sound like a prolonged struggle. As William crept closer, the bear circled through the underbrush for concealment. It emerged quickly and broke William's neck in the same fashion as it had Mark's. William now lay dead near his friends and fellow fishermen. With three young men dead and hidden by the thick vegetation, the bear had more than enough to eat but hadn't set upon them to consume them yet. Back near the shoreline, Richard was puzzled by the silence that had now overtaken the laughter and clatter the young boys had made. He was concerned as they seemed to disappear one by one, with no clues left as to where they'd gone. Richard started to look around and yell for the youngsters, but received no answers to his calls. He searched the shoreline along the lake, but could see no fishing poles, no one standing or waiting in the shallows. He started to grow uneasy at the other boys' absence and briefly searched for them near the woodline. Something wasn't right about this situation, and he couldn't figure out what it was. Once his solitude set in, he decided he would go get help to find the three boys and hastily departed to get it. He contacted local authorities and told them of the three missing boys. He recalled how he could see or hear them nearly all day, but that they suddenly, one by one, disappeared. They agreed to go to the lake and help him find them. As the search party arrived at the lake, the men spread out and began searching the area. 
They could see the fishing tackle and poles laying here and there amongst the bushes, as well as a few footprints, but the boys were nowhere to be found. After searching for a short time, the search party discovered the bodies of George and Mark Hafkeny, as well as William Rindris. The boys had all died in similar fashion, a quick bite or blow to the neck. Their bodies hadn't been consumed yet, but their wounds were clearly intended to kill. In the brush a few yards away from the bodies, a large black bear stood guard. It defended their bodies from the rescue team, but there is no source I could find stating whether the bear was killed or merely driven off so the bodies could be recovered. The attacks were deemed a predatory attack given the nature of them and the fact that the bear had guarded them. Some authorities suggested the smell of the fish the boys had caught may have brought in the bear and set up the attacks. After reviewing the somewhat limited facts surrounding this attack, I'm left wondering... Was this attack exclusively predatory, or did it have an element of territorial defense to it? Why did the bear kill more than one of the boys if it was a predatory attack? If you think it was a territorial attack, could the fish the boys caught have triggered it? If the boys had brought a gun, do you think the outcome could have been different? Do you think that bear spray could have prevented this attack? In prior episodes, we've learned that a boisterous approach to a bear food cache can temporarily run off a bear. Why do you think the boys alerting the bear to their whereabouts didn't scare it away from George's body? If you have any answers to my questions, or perhaps your own, please post them in the comments below and let's discuss it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Thank you for helping us reach 70,000 subscribers. Today's episode takes us to the frozen north of the Yukon Territory in Canada, near a small town called Mayo. It lies about 250 miles north of Whitehorse and is surrounded by wilderness and is the home range of the native tribe known as the Big River People. This area has a subarctic climate and temperatures range from minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit in winter, which lasts about six months, to 97 degrees in the summer, with extremely short spring and fall seasons. This area receives about 12 inches of precipitation per year, but most of that falls in the winter season as snow. With some of the nation's highest mountains here, in the St. Elias mountain range, the peaks stay covered in snow year-round. In the northern part of the territory, boreal forests give way to tundra. Black spruce, white spruce, quaking aspens, and balsam poplar provide a sheltering canopy for caribou, moose, mule deer, and elk to hide in. The predators of this area are plentiful and include wolves, black, brown, and polar bears, as well as cougars. It is in this setting that our story begins today. Valerie Theoret and her companion, Yermand Rochalt, had just ten months prior welcomed their first child, Adele, into the world. Theoret was originally from Quebec and moved here about ten years ago. She made fast friends and immersed herself in the Francophone community in the area. Valerie was nearing the end of her maternity leave from her sixth grade teaching position guiding children in French immersion at Whitehorse Elementary School in Whitehorse, Yukon. Herman was a 37-year-old owner-operator of a company called Wild Tracks, which guided hunting, fishing, and trapping expeditions. He was from Norway originally, but blended in in the territory and its rigorous wilderness folk. The family had purchased one of the 360 trap lines in the territory about three years ago, and it was located near Einerson Lake. Here, he harvested wolves, foxes, lynx, and other fur bearers, and she would design and sell trinkets from their fur. They would take their wares back to town and sell them at trade shows and events. While visiting the cabin, the family would live off the land and enjoy their remote haven together. Their friends indicated that they were well aware of the dangerous animal life in the area and were very experienced outdoors people. Running a trap line is a labor-intensive and perilous pursuit. Germond would frequently have to leave Valerie and their daughter at the cabin while he ventured on foot or snowmobile along their trap line to harvest animals caught in them, then reset the traps to continue to catch more. This way of life was so important to them that they'd been discussing doing it full-time and year-round. Their friends described them as having the time of their lives doing what they loved to do together. Given their experience, they knew they had to keep things clean around their cabin. They didn't leave food scraps or waste around to attract unwanted visitors. However, in their shed, they stored organs and entrails from animals to use in their trap lines as bait. They never had a problem with animals invading it, though, as it would be used up as winter passed. On the morning of November 26, the family ate breakfast together and enjoyed each other's company. 
Hermann rounded up his trapline equipment and loaded it onto his snowmobile. The couple chatted as he got ready to do his trapline check for the day, and once he was ready, Hermann headed out with his snowmobile leaving a distinct trail for him to follow to get back home. Somewhere between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., Tiorette decided to take Adele for a walk and enjoy the scenery and solitude together. She bundled the baby up, as well as herself, and placed the baby into the backpack carrier for the trip. The ladies walked along the snowmobile tracks away from the cabin. They were approaching a low-growing spruce tree when they saw something move underneath its dense boughs. While Germund was traveling the several-mile-long trapline route, a large grizzly bear was searching for food. Normally this time of year bears are hibernating, but this one has had a tough year and didn't pack on enough fat during the summer to make it through hibernation. He's emaciated and has wasted away to just over 300 pounds, but his ideal weight would have been around 600 pounds this time of year. As the bears searched the empty forest for food, its prospects were bleak. It wandered near the lake to an outfitter's camp, then in the general direction of the cabin, about 1.2 kilometers away. It eventually came across Yerban's snowmobile tracks and followed them for a considerable distance, then wandered off them again toward the creek. For some reason, the bear was drawn back to the snowmobile tracks and a direct path toward the cabin. The bear tracks left in the snow showed a transition in pace. They initially were careless and meandering as the bear dragged its feet with a shuffling gait. It then transitioned into a much more carefully placed gait, as if it was sneaking up on something. The bear was no longer shuffling its feet through the snow, rather, it was picking its paws up and carefully placing them. As the bear approached Stiorette and Adele, it must have seen them before they saw it. Its tracks dashed off the side of the path, about two meters and discreetly underneath the spruce tree. At around 2.30 p.m., Gervon was on his way back toward the cabin when he noticed a foreboding sign in his snowmobile tracks from the morning. He slowed his snowmobile down and carefully observed the tracks of a large brown bear. As he followed the trail, the tracks continued and then veered off, only to return a few hundred meters down the trail. He was far from the cabin and his family at this point, and his concern began to grow into fear. When Yermon arrived, he jumped off his snowmobile and quickly walked toward the cabin, with his 7mm Magnum Remington rifle in his hand. He opened the door and glanced around the small interior. The ladies were not there. He decided to go check to see if they were in the sauna adjacent to the cabin. The ladies were not there either. Something seemed amiss about this situation. He decided to follow their tracks in the snow as they left the cabin along his snowmobile trail. About 240 meters from the cabin, Yermon's head snapped up. A deep growl rumbled from the spruce trees in front of him. Suddenly a gaunt but large-framed bear exploded from the brush. Yermon raised his rifle to his shoulder and fired, but the bear continued to bound toward him. He fired two more times in quick succession, and still the bear continued to advance the distance. He fired one more time, and the bear piled up on the ground, dead, just two meters from him. After collecting himself, Germán began to examine the bear. As he approached it, he noticed Tiret. He had found Tiret's body. The bear had fallen very near her corpse. His mind turned to Adele. He began walking around, trying to find a clue as to where she was. He found her remains a short distance away. Both his mate and his child were killed by the bear. Germán bottled his emotions and retrieved a tarp from the cabin. He carefully placed the tarp over the ladies' bodies and activated an emergency beacon to notify the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The authorities arrived the next morning and gathered evidence of the incident and examined the bear's remains. The analysis of the bear's remains revealed it to be an 18-year-old male. It was in terrible shape, emaciated, and had a large wound in its gut. It had almost no detectable body fat. The wound in its gut had partially healed and was more serious at a prior point. The wound was believed to have happened only a few weeks before the attack. The authorities were uncertain what would cause the bear to be in such poor condition, as it was in the prime years of its life. The necropsy of the bear also revealed that it had begun eating items not normally in its diet. They found the quills of a porcupine embedded in its digestive tract. After compiling all of the information from the bear tracks and the attack, authorities believed the bear ambushed the ladies from a very close proximity, which gave them no chance to escape. They noted the danger of bears, even when they should be hibernating. 
Valerie's friend described her as a ray of sunshine in the community. They commented on how Adele was a miniature copy of her right down to her habit of smiling all the time. Her friends lamented their absence, noting she had touched a lot of people. Chief Conservation Officer Gordon Hitchcock stated that the bear attack on Tiret and Adele was a tragic chance occurrence. He indicated that humans don't fit the prey profile for bears and that they don't seek humans as prey. He finished by stating that predatory bear attacks on humans are very rare. The hibernation period for brown bears usually lasts from November through late spring. There have been three fatal brown bear attacks in Yukon Territory since 1996. Brown bears are estimated to be between six and 7,000 in population, while black bear populations are estimated to be 10,000, and polar bear populations are estimated to be 1,500 in the territory. Each year, an average of 76 grizzly bears are harvested and just under 200 black bears from the Yukon Territory. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.